Good evening, everybody. It's your favorite aspiring revolutionary here, a wandering author, reminding you that we are all the authors of our own lives. As always, my message remains the same. Spend less, live more, earn your freedom with frugality. It's my princess, Madeline, right there. Madeline. And uh, today we're going to talk about some of the actual mechanics of Periclean Athens like the state and how taxation worked on a personal level things are going well i should be i met some of my future co-workers today and um i like them i'll be training uh or beginning to train on <coughs> monday and um i've pre-prayed as far as for my content creation goes by pre-creating about 100 episodes worth of content, mostly on Aristotle's The Nicomachean Ethics, which I do want to remind you guys the reason I'm doing those videos in the first place is because Aristotle uses his ethics, which is the study of how to live a good life as a human, as a preface for his book politics which is how to organize society for the best good for everybody as in and not just like profit the way we conceptualize good today or um however you want to phrase it in our society currently but uh like the ultimate human good which is for aristotle the active exercise of our virtues right <laughs> anyways um point is is i'm prepared so I'll be able to focus on my new job while I'm still doing this. Anyways, so, last time we spoke about Athens, we got to Pericles, who inherited the state that was created by his predecessor, Ephialtes, which is a man that is relatively lost to us in terms of history, but we do know that he basically established political and judicial equality in classical age Athens, right? Now, outside of Athens, Few records were left of the methods of taxation, but what evidence has been found indicates a surprising degree of sophistication of the realm of public finance. Why does tax collection matter to us? Well, we've got the IRS and everything today, but before that, <laughs> taxes were, that's a, it requires a lot of logistical organization to successfully collect taxes. They didn't have iPhones, they didn't have social security numbers. <laughs> So, Thucydides claims that Athenian reserves exceeded 9,700 talents, which is a measure of currency back then. Tal eight, one talent is like a huge sum of money. Uh, those 9,700, that'd be worth uh, equivalent to several billion dollars in modern times. <coughs> so, not only were they able to collect taxes, they were collecting huge sums of revenue. And they did that in a lot of different ways. In the 330s, Athens spent about 40 metric tons of silver annually. That's a lot of silver. And that won't be topped for another 2,000 years until Great Britain enters the Industrial Revolution. Now, I got that from a particular historian, but I, I am kind of, I guess maybe if we only look at silver, I kind of doubt, I bet the, the Romans probably exceed Athens in terms of industrial output overall. <laughs> and, and the Romans come after Athens. Athens also collected revenue from direct taxes, selling tax-collecting contracts, which is what Rome does in the Publicani, and even Jesus Christ talks about them in the Bible, harbor dues, which are like import duties, market fees, legal fines, leases on state-owned mines, coining rent, and war booty. Really, all of these things are pretty recognizable to a modern observer. And they spent money on war, religious festivals, and they paid for public and military servants. Remember, these are like some of the first things that we can recognize that are more sophisticated than tribes, what we call states. <clears throat> um, and they do recommend, they, uh, I mean, there's a reason why in the video game Civilization, the, like, it's a step in the progress through, through the tech tree, right? <clears throat> Um, I reckon it's an important milestone in human cultural development. Private citizens were expected to support the state, despite lacking regular taxes. <clears throat> they did have two wealth taxes that helped. One of them in Greek, Isphora, which is Greek for paying in. And it, that was several hundred talents, amounted in, in overall to several hundred talents for the military. And then Lytorigia, which is the liturgy system. <clears throat> 
Now, previously members of the Ath of Athenian elite had furnished supplies to the state, trading money for status. And the liturgy system was an institutionalization of this voluntary benefaction from the archaic age. <laughs> Let's translate that into something. So before there was an IRS, basically the elite to the wealthy, the powerful of a given area supported the government because it was honorable for the status of it, right? And the liturgy system institutionalized this. Liturgies were led... <laughs> Maddie. Liturgies were led by wealthy citizens for religious and military purposes, but the Peloponnesian War eventually exposes the systems in... Maddie. But the Peloponnesian War eventually exposes this system's inherent weakness, which is an over-dependency on the rich. <laughs> so... The people that were wealthy way back at the Archaic Age, those are the guys that actually did build the prototypes to government in uh, Athens. But even though they kind of are the ones who built it, it did lead to, um, what do you call it? There's a weakness because they depend, because the states depended on these, the, 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 that was the weakest link in the chain. Because the state depended on the wealthy. If the wealthy guys that built the state were weak, um, which happens from time to time, <coughs> then the state was weak correspondingly. Pericles also began to regulate citizenship. Uh, he passes a law in 451 restricting who Athenians could marry, upturning centuries of cultural customs. Previously a child was an Athenian if their father was, but now both parents had to be Athenians. So I guess at this point in time we can into it, meaning we can deduct or deduce uh, based on the evidence that being an Athenian was becoming a valuable commodity. And Pericles, he leveled the playing field for Athenian citizens, making them equal politically and judicially, but he also created a series of laws that restricted who could qualify as an actual citizen. Plutarch recalls a tale from this era when Egyptian rebels give a gift of a grain to Athens and 5,000 people who thought they were citizens realized they weren't anymore because only Athenian citizens qualified to actually receive the grain subsidy. An epidemic of typhoid fever led to laws um, off, often led to the laws softening in 430, permitting Athenian men with no heirs to adopt sons from non-citizen mothers. So, eventually, this restrictive citizenship law is softened from, due to popular backlash, which is another uh, lesson from history. Nothing instituted by the powerful changes unless there is resistance from below. The citizenship law also further distinguished the Athenians from other Greeks. Remember, when the Delian League was formed, it was done under the pretenses of, hey, we're all Greeks, we need to defend ourselves against the Persians, and over a hundred years or so it becomes an empire for Athens, and now Athens is creating legal definitions to make themselves even greater than their supposed allies. Pericles rose to prominence as a general, and by the end of his reign, Thucydides, a Greek historian, would comment, quoting, Athens, in theory a democracy, was on the way to being ruled by the leading man. So this guy that was rose to prominence as a democratic hero ends his reign being attacked for becoming a potential tyrant. And that's where we'll end it today. Um, Thucydides was one of Pericles' biggest opponents, so we do need to take his word with a grain of salt. Thucydides will eventually be ostracized from Athens, uh, which is like basically banished or exiled. And um, this should be kept in mind. Doesn't mean that he was wrong. It could very well be that Pericles uh, was never the democratic hero that he pretended to be. Or it could be that once he was in power, uh, he got corrupted, basically. As people say, power corrupts, and complete power corrupts absolutely. Anyways, this is a wandering author, here to remind you that we are all the authors of our own lives. As always, my message remains the same. Spend less, live more. Earn your freedom with frugality. 
what are you guys doing in order to inspire, uplift, and empower, uh, uplift, uplift and empower your local community today? Because this world isn't changing unless we all do our part, and you can count on me to do mine daily. And of course, Miss Madeline. Um, until next time, love ya.